we, as a society, are terrified of teenage girls, of their sexuality, of their individualism, and of their power. We reject their assertiveness while teaching them shame over their bodies, feelings, and emotions. Ginger Snaps takes the werewolf story and uses it to not only explore this theme of society fearing changes in teenage girls, but also of teenage girls fearing these changes in themselves. The film uses the monstrosity of transformation into a literal beast as a metaphor for the loss of control teenage girls feel as their bodies change throughout puberty. The movie unashamedly pushes female puberty and sexual development to the forefront of its story and its characters in a way that is almost exclusively reserved for male stories and protagonists. Given that it was made over 20 years ago, this is fairly impressive. Made in 2000 on a shoestring budget in Canada, Ginger Snaps stars Emily Perkins as Bridget and Catherine Isabel as her sister, the titular Ginger. A mix of black comedy and naughty slasher horror, the film opens on a moody and macabre note, showcasing the apathy and otherness of the two sisters, along with their morbid fascination with death, particularly by suicide. The movie establishes that neither girl is actually depressed or suicidal and instead portrays their suicide pact, and particularly Ginger's flirtation with self-harm as a form of control and escape, an angle which mirrors many real-life teenage girls, both back then and now. The need for control and the desire to escape reality through unhealthy means is still something many teens experience and many adults can still recall. The reflection in characters like Ginger and Bridget is something women and girls of all ages can relate to, and it adds depth and humanity to the girl's story. While Ginger and Bridget are perhaps more morbidly obsessive than the average teen, their attitudes suit the moody film and helps to add to their outsider status and codependency on one another. We soon learn that another factor bonds the girls together, that of the delayed physical development of both girls. And the movie really kicks into gear when Ginger pulls ahead of her sister and starts menstruating. The film is neither gentle nor subtle about the trauma that Ginger goes through with her first period. And in a messy and unglamorous portrayal of teenage life, Ginger's first period is shown in all its glory, from the heavy blood flow, to the back pain, to the cramps, to the intensity of one's first mood swings. Are you sure it's just cramps? Just so you know, the words just and cramps, they don't go together. In a world which recoils from female puberty, seeing it portrayed in such a real manner is incredibly refreshing. What is even more fun and interesting is the way the horror film builds its narrative, themes, and metaphors around Ginger's puberty and emerging development. Not only does her development drive a wedge between herself and her sister, it's Ginger's period which lures the werewolf of the film to her, and its horrifying attack on Ginger can be seen as a metaphor for the way in which predatory men start to pursue teenage girls more aggressively as they develop sexually. Like Ginger in the film, teenage girls come to believe that their bodies are dangerous, that the natural occurrences in their biology are somehow responsible for any attacks on or predatory behavior towards them. While the violence of the attack in the movie provides the surface horror, the implications in the metaphor are infinitely scarier. In what initially seems like a lucky turn of events, Ginger does not die from her wounds, but it soon becomes apparent that she has been infected with something. While the literal infection in the movie is the werewolf curse, and Ginger's physical transformations, including a tail and extra body hair, reflect this, the infection is again used metaphorically. As Ginger starts to take on more so-called masculine traits, which are often looked down upon in women, implying that the beast's nature mirrors masculinity. These traits start with more confidence and sexual energy and build to Ginger craving sexual contact. In another subversion, Ginger is not given any romantic notions about the act, nor does she have any sort of emotional attachment to or attraction to her chosen sexual partner. Instead, choosing a fairly basic male partner who has crudely expressed interest in her. Reflecting a reality that many teenage girls have experienced, Ginger's sexual partner attempts to exert dominance over her, 
and the film refreshingly turns the tables as Ginger's werewolf nature emerges and she becomes the assailant. While never condoning real life violence, many girls and women get a curious satisfaction from watching fictional females exact the type of violence on men that so many women experience or live in fear of. Ginger's attack and subsequent infection of her male partner is a delightfully wrong indulgence for female viewers, and the symptoms he displays as a result of the infection are unsettlingly gender swapped, in particular an instance of him bleeding from the genitals. Ginger's own symptoms increase as the film continues, and the body horror she undergoes acts as a metaphor for the physical changes of female puberty and the loss of control that many girls experience during their first period and initial stages of development. The trauma of menstruation is not often discussed or even recognized in society, nor is the discomfort and body dysmorphia that many girls experience during their teenage years and often as a result or side effect of puberty. Ginger's body horror obviously goes far beyond the norm, but her reaction to her changing form is scarily relatable. In a callback to her earlier apathetic interest in self-harm, in which it was implied that her contemplation of the act was from boredom, Ginger genuinely attempts self-harm as she takes the same knife to her growing wolf's tail, terrified of the changes in her body and the loss of her bodily autonomy. Although it is told through the lens of horror, Ginger's self-mutilation is a frighteningly accurate reflection of a damaging practice that many teenage girls undertake. Self-harm is frequent amongst adolescent girls, even today, as they rebel against their own bodies, the expectations placed on them by society, and the loss of control puberty brings, not only within their own bodies, but in others' perceptions of them. As shown in the movie, the minute young girls start to develop sexually, they become objects of lust and desire from men of all ages. Self-mutilation can feel like punishment mixed with control for young girls, taking their frustrations and traumas out on themselves while condemning their own bodies for betraying them and drawing unwanted attention. The film also explores the frightening idea of female violence and directly links Ginger's emerging violent tendencies with her sexuality as a commentary on the way we view women who enjoy and engage in high levels of sex or even sex which isn't viewed as appropriate or vanilla enough. As the monster takes over her, Ginger outright admits to enjoying the sensations. It feels so good, Bridget. It's, it's like touching yourself. You know, every move, right on the fucking dot. But her reveal is met with disgust and horror, mirroring society's attitude towards female pleasure. While the movie pushes Ginger's transformation towards its violent climax, it uses her emerging monstrosity to drive a wedge between herself and the only female with whom she has a positive relationship, her sister Bridget. While Ginger and Bridget do encompass the unfortunate not-like-other-girls trope, their otherness is implied to be more from exclusion and derision, and their relationship with one another is portrayed as extremely deep and is the core dynamic at the heart of the film. It's easy to feel sympathy for both girls, as Ginger's transformation, both human and monster, slowly drives them apart. Bridget spends much of the film trying to save her sister, but in an unexpected but fitting ending, she ends up having to kill Ginger. The monster has become too much, and neither girl can contain it anymore. Ginger dies in her monster form, completely transformed and unable to revert back. It is a rather bleak ending, and, given the metaphors used within the narrative, would be a very cynical look at the monstrosity of being a teenage girl. Ginger is literally consumed by the beast within until it kills her. While she initially gets to enjoy the perks of her transformation, they soon turn on her and she gives in to the rage and violence until it overtakes her completely. It could be seen as a commentary on the way teenage girls are chewed up by society, or as a metaphor for the monsters who prey on young women, or even a nod to the way young girls sometimes feel that their bodies escape their control. Or it could just be a simple horror story about two sisters torn apart by outside forces. But I doubt it. Whatever the intentions behind the film, and I do suspect that they are deeper than the surface level werewolf story, Ginger Snaps 
shines a light on female puberty and the horror of being a teenage girl in a way films still shy away from, even today. It shows the gritty and often messy reality of young female life through the lens of the horror genre and wields its monster metaphor brilliantly. The film was, and continues to be, an influential cult classic, and rightly so. Two sequels did follow, of varying quality, but the original film still stands up today, giving young girls a relatable female protagonist, someone to suffer alongside while still living vicariously through, placed in a fun, campy horror film which still packs a punch all these years later.